So, we watched some more anime. We're going to talk about this anime. Now, I want to preface this by saying something very important. Ghost of the Shell standalone complex, first and second gig, are some of our favorite anime ever. Like, mm-hmm. it's A-class anime. They're the kind of shows... Also, Ghost of the Shell, the original movie. Also, A-plus anime. And like, the original manga, A-plus. Yep. But, like, standalone complex is the kind of thing where, like... When I was doing a little bit of research before we did this show, I pulled up a clip last night of a random scene from Second Gig, and it was real hard to not just start watching all of Second Gig again. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I'd gotten excited a while ago when I found out that there was going to be more Ghost in the Shell standalone complex, a little bit of a Homer Homer Simpson with the Froger situation. Yeah, I didn't finish watching all of the Arise. No one did because it was boring. It wasn't going anywhere. (laughs) I think we only watched one episode. Of I it in the watched theater? a bunch more, and I kept stopping because I kept forgetting to watch more because it didn't leave any impression on me at we all. Watched, I think we watched one episode in the theater. Yep, right? we did. And and then I don't think I've watched any more since, even though it seems to all be on Netflix. So I've watched all of it, and I've seen some of the episodes more than once. I am at a loss to remember enough to even tell you what happened in it. That is how forgettable it was. I can't remember anything. Standalone complex was the was the good one. So. I got excited that there was going to be more standalone complex, but because it was announced like a while ago, like a long time ago, years ago. But then I forgot about it. I just forgot that was a thing. I it, it just slipped my mind, didn't think about it. And then one day, Anna Twitter was making fun of a naked backwards flipping guy, and they said something ghost in the shell. And then I discovered that not only had it come out, but it's bad, or at least people were saying it was bad. Everyone said ghost. There's a new ghost in the shell. It's all CG. It's on Netflix, and it's they were saying it's way, way bad. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll avoid that then because, you know, there hasn't been, you know, Ghost in the Shell isn't something where it's guaranteed to be good. I mean, <laughs> the majority of the Ghost in the Shell content that exists in the universe is not great, if you look at yeah. all of it. It's like, it's pretty much, it's like the original movie, the original manga, Get Sack 1, Get Sack 2, Innocence the movie I is, like eh. Innocence, but it's not, it's got problems. Like, it's not a eh. great movie, but I really and then enjoy there's, it. And then there's Man Machine Interface, which would come next, I guess, in the yeah. rankings, and that's even more, eh. <laughs> But I figured <laughs> reviewing this would be good, one, because I want to give it a chance to see if the story, the plot, like, anything can get through the fact that it looks worse than PUBG. Right, it's like what well, we've been every. I, I sort of realized it's like, hey, all the only things we talk about in Geek Nights are things we watch or or play or whatever, and it's always stuff that we've, you know, we've judged it beforehand, and it's usually gonna be good. Has a good chance of being good before we go for it. Um, so it's pretty rare that we watch something that's bad. I said, you know what? Everyone says this is bad, but you know, uh, let's right. A, verify, yep. and B, even if it turns out that it's bad, it's like, well, we can at least do a Geek Nights on something that's bad and not yep. always something that's good. We made a pact that we would watch two episodes and no more, and if either one of us felt the urge to watch the third episode, we would tell the other one in advance. I note that I did not at any point tell you to watch episode three, and I did not receive a message from you telling me to watch episode three. Well, I didn't I, I didn't remember until today, so I watched uh, the first episode earlier today and the second one... Uh, Like, just before the show. Yep. So, uh, So even if I wanted to watch three, uh, I didn't have time. So, on one hand, the animation, like, it just, it, this show looks like a, I'd say a cutscene from a video game, but it's worse than that. It looks like a cutscene from one generation ago video game. Yeah, I think the biggest problem in the animation is that it's not low quality, right? It's like, you can take certain stills and say, wow, look at that, it's pretty good CG. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. It's that the way the characters move combined with the cell shading on the characters contrasted with this extremely highly detailed background. Oh my God, like in Aramaki's office, the wooden door has That's like- the, wor- the worst part is Aramaki's office. That exquisite door. That door looks photorealistic. And then there's this- That like- was the scene where I noticed the CG being the worst was Aramaki's standing around. Yep. And then, well, Aramaki looks like weird. Like Aramaki looks worse than any other character. <laughs> oh yeah, he's bad. Like he's <laughs> His outlined- hair is the weirdest. His hair's weird. Like he's outlined wrong. And like, yeah. it's almost like there's a different shader on him from everyone else in the show. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the other thing is that unlike, say, a B-Star, which has 
minimal action scenes, right, that are done in a in a different kind of way as to like not actually show most of the action explicitly, yep. right? Uh ghost, in, you know, this ghost in the shell at least focuses more on action scenes. Uh even though ghost in the shell usually is mostly talking yep. heads with like one action scene, this focuses a lot on action scenes yep. and com, you know, military paramilitary combat. Uh and those parts are are weird too. But the action so, scenes they're weird for a bunch of reasons. Like I got I got a lot to say about this show the more I think about a, it. So that but the point is the contrast with the the cell sh- the, the the moving parts against the non-moving background makes it look yeah. way it's, it ends up being one of the weird CGs and not yep. one of the good CGs. Like honestly right? like, a, like say a Dragon Prince or a Beastar. Yeah, well like Dragon you know. Dragon Prince I was going to bring up myself too because Dragon Prince had some awkward animation but the characters, the story, everything else made it very easy for me to just see past that and enjoy the show. This, yeah. there's nothing to see. Like, the characters don't even feel like the Ghost in the Shell characters. The dialogue is stilted and, like, really prosaic. Like, the, like the characters don't say anything interesting to each other really ever. The setting is vague, unrealistic, and also almost a betrayal of, like, the arc of Ghost in the Shell up to this point. Like, you look at where Standalone Complex second gig ended, this show is almost like a reversion. Like, they step back into, well, Section 9 got disbanded again. Now we're going to reform it again. Vague political plot again. But it's a slightly different political plot that has way less nuance. Yeah, I think, you know, so plot-wise, right, it's something about the world is now in perpetual war and there's one percenters, but there's an evil good one percenter. Who's funding. Who's... It's Mad Max world now because of economic warfare. Uh, you get this. The, the show starts with just this long narration like, of right. here is the state of the world. It doesn't even and feel like Ghost in the part, Shell anymore. I think that's part of the that, that's a huge part of the problem because uh, Ghost in the Shell has never like doesn't usually explicitly tell you all how like the world is structured. Yeah, it's all incidental storytelling. Right? Like they don't tell you, oh, section nine does this because section eight does this and section seven does this. And so, you know, the kind of stuff that nerds love that I hate, that like that mm-hmm. world building for no purpose other than world building. Ghost in the Shell will just be like, you run into section, public security section six because reasons and they're not, their deal is not fully explained because it doesn't matter. Right, they don't explain how the world is structured or how the economy is doing or the, any of the big picture, right? You're seeing in Ghost in the Shell, you're all you're seeing, you know, Section 9 plays this small role in this on these, you know, the, the what's, you know, their mission, yeah. right? That they're on. They're it's basically like, the you know, there's, there's like a terrorist. A- yeah, there's a terrorist here doing this. You got to stop them. It's obviously in the interest of whoever's commanding them. And you're, it's always a mystery who's commanding them. That the the surroundings of like why is this guy doing this? Why are they bad? Why did they? Why did ghosts? Why did you know Section Nine's bosses want this done? Right? You know the opposition they meet. What are their motivations? Who are their bosses? And what is their bigger picture? You don't see any of that directly. It's always indirect inference, figuring it out. Maybe you never find out at all. Yep. That's how Ghost in the Shell is always Point of told. view of soldiers. So, uh, I would almost say professionals, but professionals in the Master Keaton way who have basically given up any semblance of a life to live this life. But you see it from their perspective of, you got your marching orders, go do the thing. Right. And here, by explicitly in some detail, not perfect detail, but in some detail, like explaining the state the world is in and focusing on that, it's sort of like meh. It, yep. it like ruins that whole aspect. And it keeps like reminding you like, oh, well, the setting is like this for these reasons. Right. You know what it feels and like? Watching this feels like reading the Wikipedia page about this show. Right. Like so there's no watching watch it ghost or in reading the show, Wikipedia is the same. Right. So when I watch a ghost in the shell, the reason I like it is because A, you care about the characters, right? Yep. Uh, B, you care about what the characters are doing, right? Yep. Uh, C, there's some um, usually something going on that's always asking. It's constantly asking you all sort of like transhumanist cyberpunk kind of questions, right? Yep. And scenarios and morals, right? Uh, along, right? So it's like, okay, the you know they got orders to go stop this hacking guy, but what's that hacking guy about? Oh, he's doing this thing, and that guy is, you know, there's some moral re- cyber moral related to to what that guy's up to that they're after. Yep. Right. 
And I, this uh, one's going to have that same plot, it feels like, from like what I read of spoilers after I watched the first two episodes. But it just it feels like someone barfing out a list of spoilers or like a comic book that someone would read literally just to find out what happened to Spider-Man, but they don't care about the artistry of it. Yeah. So another thing, all right, is that Ghost in the Shell, in most of its iterations that I can think of, uh, has a somewhat consistent mood to it. Where it's sort of like dark, eerie, cyberpunky. Yep. Often very right? zoomed in. Action scenes tend to be very sharp and punctuating, surrounded by long silences and tension. Right. This one's just like uh, what, like literally watching a PUBG match. Very, very surreal. Yeah, right? I, th- I, th- I think about the episode where there's like a, a brain, uh, like that they find at a bazaar that the the yeah, the, and they like jack into it to see what's going on in there. And it's like a weird kind of, you know, the, that or the one where, of, where it gets into the major's past with her hallucinations. Right. Exactly. The same kind of deals. Right. Or, you know, the one where, uh, was it like Bato goes to a dojo or something? The or best, the, my favorite Aramaki episode. Aramaki with the wine cellar one. In all of Standalone Complex is still the one where you find out where Saito, the sniper, like how he joined the major. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, the point is, is you get, those are A, character episodes. Yep. Right, which you're not getting anything out of here. B, they actually show it. They don't just tell you. <laughs> right, but they have this this mood to them, right? All of mm. Ghost in the Shell has this same mood. And and Ghost in the Shell, was it 2045, right? That mood is just completely obliterated in the opener with its weird-ass song. Oh, my God. Now, right? I was almost okay with that opener because... It's an okay song. It just not, does not fit Ghost in the Shell. Yeah, I could see it fitting if the show were better in the sense that this is the like this would be the standalone complex like third gig where it gets into the fact that really section nine just does what money wants it to do like Mm -hmm. you can see there there's a direction you could go with that but i don't think that's the direction this show's going also you didn't watch westworld the opening is like almost identical to the westworld opening but westworld is very like serious like music build up and this one is more hmm? this one is more like westworld you'll brenner (laughs) <laughs> i don't know any other west worlds yeah you haven't seen the new west world at all <laughs> does it have yule brenner in it actually yes <laughs> you'll there is a yule brenner cameo in the new west he, world but he died before they made the new west world yeah but the new west world is about the same thing as the old west world and at one point they go into this like warehouse of a bunch of old like previous generation west world stuff and there's a yule brenner just standing there right in the front Okay, I'll watch that episode. Yeah, uh, you can find a clip of it on YouTube. Search for like uh, Yule Brenner New Westworld and you'll see him there. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but the opener reminds me of the Westworld opener and Westworld deals with a lot of these same transhumanist themes. But I don't think the Money Makes the World Go Round song is like this subversion of you thought the standalone complex and like Section 9 were doing these noble things, but really they just do what money and government... Like, I don't feel like right. that subversion is there. I don't feel like I the know, show is all of doing the, that on purpose. All of the cyberpunk stuff has basically been removed, right? It is in, in the it, rest of the show. The rest of the show is about these post-humans who are trying to get rid of the regular humans and all sorts of stuff. Oh, okay, maybe. You know, but regardless, it's like you're just watching, at least in the first two episodes, what is otherwise just you know, like a Mission Impossible kind of deal, right? Like team of people have to go out and do a military thing. All right, so let's right? talk about that. So let's uh, say... They just, and there's no, you know, it's like, yeah, the weapons they're using, it's like, oh, they hack someone's brain and they have, there's a crazy drone with AI, but there's no, it, it, that doesn't play into the moral or the plot. It just plays into the to the, the action on screen. But also the action on the screen... That. Like what it, I could see if the show was doing that sort of subversive twist on Ghost in the Shell, and then you get these scenes where like it's heavy action, like they're just mercenaries now because the plot of episode one is they literally are just mercenaries working in like America in Palm right. Springs, just in a Mad Max apocalypse. But just I like, think here's the best way to describe it, right? So here in 2045, we see them using tachikomas, yep. right? Which we also see them doing in Standalone Complex, right? But in Standalone Complex. They're not just using the Tachikomas in battle. There is a major plot line, yep. right? Perhaps the most major plot line. It is. It shows about the Tachikomas and their AI and what the deal is. Yep. Right. There's and the show, every this scene, show is not in any way about that. It, it not, might right? get that way later, but it, I don't think it's going to do it in a satisfying way. But right. the Tachikomas also even 
action scenes would have little like things the Tachikomas did that continued to tell that story of what's up with the Tachikomas. Like, right, the, like, like be- they would make a decision that people were surprised by, but then that like they wouldn't focus on that as the plot, but that sort of incidental storytelling would build up to the climax of the show and these transhumanist ideas. The show just does not feel like it's right. going there. Here, the Tachikomas are literally just talking weapons. They're not doing anything. Yep. They're not characters. But right? even if, let's say this was this, this was all on purpose, the action scenes themselves are also really badly done. Like the fight choreography doesn't make any goddamn sense at all. Like mm-hmm. those, these cars are driving behind them, shooting at them for like five minutes while they talk. And yet not a single bullet even comes near anybody. Like it doesn't even make sense from the perspective of an action scene. Yeah, no, not a lot of the stuff doesn't make sense. And but it seems ca- like someone just came up with scenes they wanted to see. Yeah. Like, Oh, we want to see the, her, go into the sky and grab a drone, right? And it's like, okay. And then they found a way to make it happen. Yep. But the characters also don't really feel like the characters you know from Ghost in the Shell. Like They have the same voice actors and nominally the same characters. But their dialogue is bad. The dialogue is so, like, clipped and prosaic. Like, the conversations they have, you could swap which character says what line and it really wouldn't matter for the most part. The, The character with the most character... Is actually the new guy, yeah. the clown, clown, right? Uh, who you know is probably just gonna like is a traitor or is gonna get killed or something. Who something's knows? up. Yeah, something's up with that new guy. But they actually, even though the new guy's character is very flimsy, he's basically you know guy who has some skills but way less skills, way less experience, way less discipline, yep. and sort of silly, right? Uh, you know, likes to act up and get out of line. Like, a, you know, it's pretty stereotypical for a new guy on a team, right? In any sort of uh, team-based, like, you know, action kind of thing. Uh, but that paper-thin, uh, you know, personality he has is more than the other characters have, which is, is zero. Yeah, but, like, the things the characters All their personality often, from the previous shows has been removed. Like, they don't make sense. Like, Vato, like acting like they're actually going to drink this beer in a party when really they're on the way to a mission. Like the dialogue didn't really make sense. It felt like they were just filling time and like, gotta have the characters talk before the fight scene. But they also subverted some of the characters. Like Togusa is now like divorced. Like they've just changed whole cloth, how some of the characters exist in the universe. Right. And it's like, that's the kind of thing where like the whole point of that character was that he's the only one who's holding on to a normal life outside of this paramilitary life. Like that was an arc across multiple seasons and both movies. Right. And that was like a constant, that was like a thing that made, that was like made his, him like have a deal. Right. Is, is like, this guy actually has like a family and a life. Every single other person is completely alone in the world. Yep. Right. They have no family. They have no friends you ever see. Like they throw themselves into their work because there's no connections. Right. No, nothing. Right. Togusa has this family, this wife and kid. Right. And it's like, and he's involved. He's the only one involved who knows anyone else. And he's, you know, also mostly human, right? Yep. Almost entirely human, right? And it sets him apart, but yet you still see him doing the job and he's awesome. Uh, and that's like his whole reason for being there, right? Is to, you know, connect, you know, make that connection. I do right? want to say, I feel like and Paz and Borma do have both him- have lives outside, but they keep it secretive. Like, it. Because the show really focuses on the major and Bato, like a really limited set of the characters. Who well, you see, like in Standalone Complex, I just mentioned, right? It was, you know, those episodes, you know, Bato and the dojo and, uh, you know, Aramaki and the wine cellar, yep. right? Do show they have some outside connections to, to some people, right? Professional or The otherwise. people who really don't are like the major. <laughs> yeah, the major doesn't know anybody. Yeah. Uh, but anyway... The point is, is that's what that character is about. So by removing that, it's like, well, what's Togus about now, right? Well, the only thing he's about now is being mostly human, I guess. But they don't even bring that up. Yeah. And they've removed all cyberpunk moral storytelling. So that doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. But then what really rankled me that pushed me over the line of not caring about the show was when the plot in the second episode, it gets revealed that Aramaki is reforming Section 9. That is literally how, like, second gig starts. That's how almost every Ghost in the Shell starts. Either they're well, forming Section 9 or they're reforming Section 9. And it's so, the way they're reforming it's just like, well, the Prime Minister wants us to reform it. Okay. Yep. We'll do it then. It's like you didn't have any, like, 
And then they Better explain that plot about it. how the prime minister is actually an American who's going to just be a puppet of American interest. Like, it says out loud the things that, one, don't fucking matter to a show like this. And two, in a good Ghost in the Shell, you figure that out if you care in the background, but it doesn't matter. If it matter. matters. And, but even then, even if it doesn't ma- if it matters, you still don't need to figure it out to understand the rest of the show. Right. Because Go- the- a, good, a good Ghost in the Shell is the type of anime where they're... You know, trying to catch like a hacker in a random neighborhood who's right, and they hacked into. I guess I remember some Ghost in the Shell scenes. They're like hacking the garbage man or something, yep. right? Something like that. And on a TV that the garbage man is watching, it says, "New Prime Minister elected, first American, new American Prime Minister of Japan." Yeah. And then it cuts away because you're actually focusing on the garbage man's conversation. Yeah. But right? then five you, episodes later, that prime minister, like suddenly it's like, oh, the prime minister the, cut our right. funding. And they're like, what? Shit. Oh, no. Yeah. The prime minister like makes an announcement, something, something. And then that's all you see. Right. You don't. But then the final, final line was the closer. Why can't the show look like that? The closing the clo- animation I did note it, looks great. I was going to say, as bad as the opener is with its with its song that doesn't fit, that's not yep. a bad song. It's just a non-fitting song. Yep. When the closer started, I was like, oh, this closer seems like is a completely normal closer that belongs on a Ghost in the Shell. It felt like Ghost in the Shell closer, and also the animation looked good. The character designs looked good. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are parts of the animation that look good, but... Uh... Yeah, well, like, but like the thing that looked good in the fight scene was that robot dog, but... They set up that robot dog like, oh, what's that kind of robot? That was, I don't the, know. That was the weirdest bad Chekhov's dog. Yeah, but they did, like that scene and a different ghost in the shell would have had an appropriate amount of menace. Like, we don't know what that box is. We got to worry about it. And when the box does its thing, it's going it to be something fucking it, insane. But in right. this, it's like, oh, it's just a guard dog. And how did they defeat it? They just shot it. Yeah, the, I mean, it was strange to me. It's like the the power level of the characters seems to, it was like it was all over know, the place. It's like in you know, it's like the major in the original Ghost in the Shell movie, like ripped the tank apart right with their hands. Uh, yeah. So it damaged her too, right? But the um, you know they're really fucking strong. So it's like even that dog and the the drone that they try to make scary. It's like um why were those scary it's like the major like should have just like yeah. been like oh it's, it's a little robot dog whatever like right? they could have shot it immediately like, but they they're don't. not scared it causes a bunch of problems and then like 10 minutes later in the episode or i think the next episode they just shoot it like they could have done right. that it's the not scary for them at all i don't know why they they acted scared of it and the, they tried to present it as being dangerous but it wasn't for yep. them you'd and the drone could have been scary, but it's like, no, why did the Majors hack the drone and bring it down? She's good enough. It's like They they strange. lampshaded that by saying that the drone was running autonomous. Sure. It was still strange. Yeah. Um It's just the show Also that also gives you another point, right? It's like, all right, so the Major does some crazy action scene stuff and gets up there to the drone, right? Okay, the drone is not having any networking. It's running autonomously, right? Something like that, Yep, right? in Standalone Complex, uh, she would, in like, plug Complex, into it. She would have plugged into that shit and been and, and and hacked in and be like, who's controlling this drone? Who programmed it, did, 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 right? Yep, and As then it would have cut to, like, to, an evil guy, like, pulling oh, the plug there's an AI, and the drone there's explodes. An AI, there's an AI. Someone has actually been trapped in this drone. Who is it, right? Yep, oh, ooh, the AI right? who's trapped wants to get the message out and tells the major something that we don't get to see and then that comes up five episodes later right you know something like that as opposed to all right she dragged it to the ground and destroyed it yeah mostly oh but it still yeah. got a missile off which i guess we was trying to do all along so i still don't understand what all these PUBG like Fortnite looking kids are doing in the show in the first place <laughs> yeah anyway but one thing when i was watching with emily and she pointed out that the character designs looked like this one designer and it was uh ilyai kushinov uh and those character designs look great, except in the actual show, like in the closer or on like that designer's Instagram, they look great. It's just in the show, they're animated in this kind of weird, ugly, one generation ago video game way. Uh, so I also want to talk about, right, so we talk about almost all the characters, except for uh, Ishikawa, right? Who's basically always been like the hacking dude. Yeah, he right? just sits in the base hacking. Right, he does he does some other stuff. He does some yeah. action also. But you know, it's like, you know, his main plots are like 
aha, I've hacked all the brains of the old dudes in the pachinko parlor to power up my computer, right? So he doesn't do any of that. He basically drives and shoots a machine gun and doesn't do anything else. Yep. Well, what about Saito? The, the second at best least sniper Saito is still, in the history at least of the world. At least he's still sniper guy. Yeah, but he also like it doesn't really solve their problem. When in no. regular Ghost in the Shell, when Saito gets out his gun, the whole point of the show is that solves the problem. He doesn't miss. Yeah. I think he missed, actually. I think he did he miss. He was he was like ah oh, he tried to shoot the drone and missed. It's like well because it, it like missed. it hacked him and saw his satellite feed and it just the show just doesn't feel like Ghost in the Shell at all. Yeah no. Uh, anyway, so even though the show is not good, <laughs> it is far away from good, right? I do want to say it is not the worst. Oh, I've seen worse. I've seen far I've seen a lot worse. worse. So I think what you're seeing, I think the reaction to the show saying how bad it is. It's not incorrect. It is bad. Well, because we're comparing it to but, what the ghost in the shell we like. Exactly. I think this is a situation much like Death Note, where if you haven't read or watched any Death Note, right? Death Note has two phases. There is the beginning, like most of Death Note is yep. about this battle between these two characters. That battle reaches its climax and conclusion. And then some new characters come in and continue the battle, right? And then that, and and then the when that battle ends, the story ends. And th- when that second battle begins, right? Uh, pe- people who are fans of Death Note like that a lot less. They thought that like they were like, oh, it turned to garbage, right? It's like, oh, it sucks now. Only that first battle yep. is good. But the right? second part wasn't um, bad. It just wasn't. The second as part good. wasn't bad. It just wasn't as good and didn't include characters that you'd already grown close to mm-hmm. and loved, right? So it felt. The, the, the relational feelings, right, made it seem awful because it's like one second you're eating the best steak on earth and the next second you're eating serviceable steak. So it tastes awful, but relatively speaking, right? Whereas if I had just given you serviceable steak, you would have said, that's pretty good, right? But because you were just eating delicious, amazing steak, the second one was meh, yep. right? The problem so, is I feel like anyone who has not already seen all the other ghosts in the shell wouldn't have anything to even hook them on this show at all. They'd watch the first episode and go, what I the would fuck be was very this? interested to see what someone who is, doesn't know anything about Ghost in the Shell would right? think of the show. Because I think the problem would be, why would you care at all? Yep. And because right? the characters because it doesn't are have so... the character, right. It's like the, not having the character stuff at all. At least somebody who's seen other Ghost in the Shells might care about the characters because they already care about them because they watched the good show. But then they're mad right? because these characters don't live up to those characters. Right, exactly. But uh, if you have not seen anything at all, why do you care at all? You weren't made to care to start with. Yep. Right? Where you see something like, you know, if you read, uh, you know who's really always really good at this is, um, what's it called? Uh, Naoki Urasawa, right? Uh, you, you read a Naoki Urasawa manga, and there'll be like a character who's there for one chapter, right? Like you, you want you read a chapter. Yep. Or you look at it. it start of the chapter, you're like, "Who's this guy?" End of the chapter, you're literally crying. Right. Master for that guy. Keaton meets someone at the beginning of this chapter, and they're dead at the end, and you just met them, and you they're, they only exist for twenty pages, and he made you care about them in twenty pages. Yep. Right. It's like you might even cry over that person. Ghost in the Shell. I'm thinking about like, a specific Pluto thing that happens. Right. It's like <laughs> Ghost in the Shell. I've seen two movies and two TV series and two mangas, and you can't make me, you made me uncare <laughs> about the characters. Yep. So like, don't recommend actually watching this one, really. Like, no, I just, all I'm saying is like, it's not a zero. It's like, um, well, because a zero uh, is like Legend of Lenmere. Right. It's not trash. It's just, meh. It's below meh. Yeah. It's more like, it's like, it's fart noise, but poop doesn't come out. Yep. Like, you won't, you don't, you're not forced to flee the you know room, it but it's, it's sad trombone. Yeah. Which is such a shame. But on the other hand, it reminded me that I could just watch Standalone Complex again. I forgot most of it. Let's go. Yeah. I, I, I watched it. All the, I remember the big parts. I just don't remember any of the details because it's been how many years? Yep. So, uh, yeah, that was our review. I'm curious to see what any of you think if you've even watched this. Remember, yes, but in the, in the future, if there is even bad stuff, 
right? Uh, don't, if so, people are saying something's bad, don't subject yourself to it. We will do that service for you and then add our opinion to the pile of everyone else's opinion. I think we'll only do that, though, if it's plausible you to also the disregard. thing could be good. Things that are, uh, like, bad, like, things that in Judge Anime by its cover, we would just say as bad outright. We're not going to bother doing this with. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to, you know, I don't want to just always have Geek Nights be we watched, played, read a good thing, and then told you about it, and we knew it was good before we started, right? Yeah. We got to go into some uncharted or questionable uh, you know, go past some warning signs into dangerous territories to report our findings and do some reconnaissance. Yeah, we used to do a lot more bad reviews, especially of anime and video games uh, and board games. Uh, part of the reason why we avoid bad reviews of board games is that <laughs> most board games are bad, like most things are bad, and we just don't even bother playing bad board games. Like, we don't even have anything to say about them. Well, it usually. takes such a time investment, I think, right? Yeah. It took me f less than an hour to watch these two episodes, right? Yep. What would the but time to, investment But to play a bad board game enough to be able to properly critique why it's bad, that would take, like, eight hours of work. And that is yeah, not worth it for a bad board game. <laughs> not worth it. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. And the Patreon patrons for this episode of Geek Nights are Alan Joyce, Hank McNichol, Marty Greeny, just like a dude guy, Kishar Tavishin, Graham Finch, you hold the key to my heart. But she packed my suitcase and sent me on my way. Clinton Walton, Jay Bantz, Ren from New Zealand, with three exclamation points. Ryan Perrin, Nicholas Brandau, Chris Midkiff, Sailor Vista, The Thirst for Hydrated Ganon, Dread Lily Tenebrae, Chris Reimer, Finn, Sean Klein, Sherman Von Horrell, and a whole bunch of people who don't want me to say their name. <laughs>